week, we'll go to chapter 5, uh, verse, uh, verse 16 uh, this, this morning. Just a little, little update uh, the, uh, uh, on Charlie. So it's nice to have Maddie back with us. Uh, but Charlie is, uh, I talked to him yesterday, uh, and the reason he's in so much pain in, in terms of his back is because he's got a fracture and, uh, in his spine. And um, I'm assuming when you're 100, things don't heal quite as quickly as they, they might if you're 20. So, uh, just, uh, so he's, he is not any better than he was two weeks ago in terms of the pain and so forth and trying to get around. So uh, just uh, encourage you to uh, keep him in your prayers. And um, as you know, when you're going through something like that and it just doesn't appear to be making any headway, it can be very discouraging uh, as well. So I uh, just encourage you to keep Charlie in your prayers. All right. Well, uh, the high price of a hypocrisy. So we're going to, uh, again, still looking at the early church. And uh, we've seen uh, Peter and John in our study a few weeks ago uh, going into the temple uh, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, they walked past the court of the women through the, uh, the beautiful gate, the Nicanor Gate, uh, which was uh, awesome in appearance. Uh, there's a guy there that's been lame since his... Uh, since his birth, he's now 40 years old, and uh, he's not just lame, his, uh, his ankles and so forth are actually deformed, so he is visibly crippled, uh, and of course then Peter uh, says to him, although he may have passed this man a hundred times as far as we know, and so did Jesus, but on this occasion, God prompts him to say, uh, he's asking for alms, he says, silver and gold have I none, but what I give thee... Uh, in the name of uh, Jesus Christ, arise and walks and has the faith to grab the guy and pull him up to his feet. Uh, he uh, gets uh, a little excited about that and uh, goes on into the uh, temple, uh, the, the court of the men there. Uh, everybody knows who this guy is. They all declare it to be a miracle. Crowd gathers, Peter preaches, and 2,000 more men come to faith uh, in Christ. Uh, that gets the Sadducees a little bit excited there. Uh, they are the controlling factor in terms of the temple, the money, the finances, and power, and so forth. And we mentioned the fact in the book of Acts, uh, they are the group bringing the persecution of the believers as opposed to the Pharisees in the Gospels. Uh, so you've got uh, Annas, who's the, uh, the old man. He's got five brothers, his son-in-law. Caiaphas is the uh, reigning high priest at the time. Peter and John are brought in. Uh, and basically, uh, get a little tongue lashing, told to no longer preach in the name of Jesus. Uh, and then the, uh, they kind of said, I don't think we can do that. And, uh, and they leave. And of course, we looked at their, then last week, their prayer, uh, which was uh, awesome. Uh, and uh, and uh, one of the things about it we noted very importantly is that they never prayed to have their circumstances changed. They prayed to be changed in the midst of their circumstances. They didn't pray for the persecution to cease. Uh, they prayed rather uh, that God would strengthen them and give them a boldness in the middle uh, of those circumstances. So uh, some great lessons from their prayer uh, last week. Here now the focus once again on this early church, on the incredible love that they have for each other, <laughs> the incredible fear that's going to come upon them, which is a healthy thing. They have a healthy fear of the Lord. Uh, and of course, in the great power that uh, God uh, enables them to work through. So again, Satan attacks the church uh, often uh, externally uh, through persecution, as we've seen. Now the attack will come internally uh, right within their midst as we have this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, who will, for whatever reasons, and we'll speculate a little bit, but obviously pride had to be at the root of it, uh, will again, as Peter says, lie to God, lie to the Holy Spirit, pretend to be there's something that they're not, uh, and they will meet with uh, devastating uh, consequences. Those things continue. <laughs> Satan still continues to try to attack the church without and attack the church with, uh, within, and, uh, and it's uh, good for us to be aware of both of those tactics. Well, let's look at the, uh, the fact that they were, were saying consistent uh, in their love, verse 32 to 37. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them 
and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, or Joseph, uh, who was also named um, Barnabas uh, by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite from the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So uh, first about this love, it uh, was certainly was uh, right in their midst in the church that produced a tremendous unity. The phrase here was of one heart and one, uh, one soul. Uh, and again, it's not a man-made uniformity. It's not like, let's all look the same and dress the same. Let's make sure we got the same haircuts and the same kind of shoes. Uh, it's not that at all. This is a, a very diverse group uh, of people. Yes, they're all Jewish at this point, but they're from all over uh, the Middle East uh, that have come to faith uh, in Christ. We'll make mention of a few of those groups uh, uh, in a moment. But, and, and it was never their uh, intention. They didn't have little meetings to figure out how they could have unity among themselves. They didn't have unity rallies or anything. Uh, they simply uh, were excited about Jesus being their Messiah. Uh, they'd come to know his love and his grace. Uh, and they were growing in their relationship with him. And the results of that were they have one heart uh, and one, uh, one soul. We think about Jesus and his, what we call his high priestly prayer in John 17. Uh, praying for unity within the church. Uh, so that the world would know that he has uh, uh, actually sent us. In other words, Jesus says it's a key to evangelism for people to see this kind of thing within the body of Christ, within the church, uh, even, even today. Uh, and so sometimes there's attempts to try to create this uh, unity within the church, or at least uh, have our banners and slogans and so forth that would indicate that we do have it. Uh, but my whole, my whole thing here is to see that they never attempted to do any of this. They were only attempting to worship God, uh, draw closer with him, uh, and, uh, and do what they could to help and support uh, one another. Uh, and there's a real distinction, certainly, with folks uh, in the body of Christ versus outside the body of Christ. Paul puts it this way, 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man, the unbeliever, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them uh, because they are spiritually uh, discerned. And that's why sometimes uh, we... Uh, we have uh, people, our friends, our family members uh, make remarks to us because they don't understand why we do what we do. You have to go every week. I mean, you went last week. You, you have to go every week. You've been studying that book for years. It's only one book. You, you have to twice a week, and now you're listening on the, uh, you know, what is the deal? You know, do you have to be, uh, you know, you get this reaction. And so some people uh, in, you know, you know, some of us feel closer to each other than we do our own, our own families if they're, if they're not saved. Uh, there's a different dynamic. Uh, the man without the spirit, uh, you know, does not understand. He doesn't get it. We're just on, on two different wavelengths uh, in terms of, uh, of the things of God. Uh, and so it, one of the incredible things about being a Christian is being in the, in the body of Christ and, and having this kind of a oneness and, and relationship, uh, uh, you know, with, with others. And you know, one of the really cool things is, is uh, if you have the opportunity to travel or do a short-term mission trip, and uh, of course the military folks uh, see it all the time every three years, where they're just suddenly plunged into a, a new location, a new environment, and they have to find a new church. And then when you can go in and find people that are, that are like you and like-minded, and you're in another body, and you don't hardly know them, but all of a sudden it's like you've known them forever, you know. Uh, and it's really cool if they don't even speak your language and so forth. And, there, and there's still this, this uh, thing going on, you know, it's, uh, and it's a Holy Spirit thing. It's just a thing that God brings uh, into the church, into the life of the believer. Uh, and it was powerful uh, and, uh, uh, in their, uh, their lives here. Now, again, when Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost, uh, notice for, from earlier <clears throat> in Acts 2, there were Parthians, Medes, uh, Eliamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phygia, Phygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and all the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Jews, converts to Judaism, Cretans, and uh, I think they're on Star Wars, Cretans, I think, uh, and Arabs. But uh, anyway, just to say, uh, you know, yeah, they're all Jewish, but uh, they don't eat the same foods, they don't dress alike, they don't speak the same language. Tremendous diversity uh, within the early church, but of one heart and, and one mind. It's 
uh, it's quite a statement. Uh, now, I like what A.W. Tozer says about this. He gives a little illustration, uh, I think, that will help kind of make my point here. Uh, and just quoting from, uh, from him, he says, uh, Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork, tuning fork, are automatically tuned to each other? Uh, they are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meet together. Each one looking away to Christ are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. Uh, it's just the byproduct uh, that, uh, that happens as we're growing closer to the Lord. If there's disunity within the body of Christ, uh, we could say it's a people problem. Ultimately, it's a problem with people and their relationship with God. Because if we're all drawing closer to him, uh, we just are like these pianos. We're all getting tuned to the same fork and, hey, by the way, this is pretty cool. What's going on here? Uh, it's just a byproduct, uh, and it's an awesome thing uh, when it occurs. Uh, again, we would say it's not just theological uh, with these guys. It's very tangible. For it says, for all who were possessors of lands or houses uh, sold them. Now, this doesn't mean that every believer sold everything they had and all brought it uh, uh, all, all in. Uh, it's not a, a form of early communism. Communism <laughs> says, uh, uh, what is yours now belongs to everybody, a redistribution of wealth. Uh, no, Christianity says, uh, what I have, uh, I'm, be, I'm more than willing to share with you if you're in need. Uh, that's, that's a very different thing. One is uh, be moved by the Holy Spirit to be generous with somebody in need. Uh, the other one is mandatory. You're doing this whether you, uh, whether you like it or not. And, uh, and that's what was going on here. There was just uh, a generosity, a giving spirit that permeated this uh, tremendous early church. Verse 5 says, <clears throat> and laid them at the apostles' feet. And I just want to mention I'm kind of like an apostle. Not exactly. No, I'm just kidding. No, we don't, we don't see a real, re somebody's paying attention here. Uh, we don't really see this happening, you know, later in the New Testament. We've got lots of uh, principles laid out for finances and, uh, and for, uh, you know, overseeing things and, uh, and so forth. And um, uh, we'll see uh, later uh, in our study as we move a little along a group of uh, men that are elected to actually make sure the widows and orphans are taken care of and so forth. But keep in mind that when many of them came to faith in Jesus as their Messiah, uh, they then were ostracized by their family, which meant very often that meant they lost their home as well as their job. Because you probably got the the training in your trade from your father who got it from his father who got it from his father. And, uh, and if the whole family didn't come to faith in Jesus the Messiah, then, then uh, no job. And by the way, uh, they, uh, well, we, we kind of like, uh, you know, we're so Asian here, we're like them. Uh, when uh, uh, we kind of just keep building onto our houses so our kids can, can keep uh, uh, living with us, with their families and so forth. And um, uh, very typical here in Hawaii, and, and that's the way it was uh, for them. So you might lose your home as well as your job. Uh, very uh, difficult circumstances they were living under, but some just saw the need, and, uh, uh, and some of them, as moved by the Holy Spirit, sold some of their property and so forth uh, and uh, used that to meet the needs uh, of others. Uh, their love for each other uh, was very uh, tangible, not just theological. But it was also very spiritual, we would also see in verse 33, where it says, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, uh, and great grace was upon uh, them all. So it was seen with uh, uh, great power. The word great uh, in the Greek is where we get our word uh, mega. <laughs> and uh, so they had mega power uh, in their lives. To do what? What were they actually doing with this great power? They were using it to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, that was the message. That was the heart of their message. Jesus Christ was no longer in the tomb. He had been raised from the dead. He had appeared for a period of over 40 days. Many of them right there had seen him in his resurrected form uh, uh, in state. Certainly not all of them, but many of them had. Uh, and, uh, and they were proclaiming the message of the resurrection. It's why we meet on Sundays, by the way. You know, we have a, you know, we'll focus certainly uh, on an Easter message on the resurrection of Jesus Christ very appropriately and so forth. Uh, but uh, every time we meet, we're, we're pretty much focused on the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. 
uh, because it is our message. It's what makes us distinct and different from all the other messages uh, that, that are out there. Uh, and it doesn't matter what religious uh, leader uh, you might have in mind or in view, but they're all still in their, uh, in, in their tombs. Uh, I remember a number of years ago, we were on a short-term trip with some of the kids from the church here. <clears throat> we were in Beijing, and we were in Tiananmen Square, and I was talking to the brother that was with us, uh, and uh, again, we were delivering uh, materials to the house church there. Uh, and and, and you probably see, everybody's probably seen on the news pictures of Tiananmen Square. Uh, and you see the, you know, the Mao picture up, up there on the gate that goes into the Forbidden City. But if you could spin the other way, in the middle of Tiananmen Square, uh, there's a, a huge shrine where the, uh, the body of Mao Zedong is. Uh, and there's always a line of people going by to view uh, his body. Now, what's interesting about it is that many of them, probably especially the older uh, Chinese, literally worship and they worship him. They have no idea what kind of a, uh, a person uh, that he actually was. To quote his personal physician, though, he said he was a butcher, uh, but uh, a brutal man, uh, but uh, through propaganda and so forth, actually worshiped by the Chinese. Worship, but his body is there. Uh, no body with Jesus, uh, he rose again from the dead. And it makes a difference. It made a difference yesterday morning when I got a call in the middle of our prayer meeting here, and I called my auntie back real quick, afterwards and <clears throat> found out that my dad's uh, one of my dad's younger brothers uh, had just passed away. I gave my uh, dad a call. My dad's the oldest of five brothers. And at that point, it's him and the youngest brother. Some of you have met Uncle Tom. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, they're 20 years apart, so he's lost the, the three brothers uh, in between. I gave my dad a call and see how he's doing, although I kind of knew already. Uh, and he said, yeah, and I mentioned that uh, Lydia had called and so forth, and, uh, you know, I was aware of Uncle Bill and stuff, and he said, yeah, 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 that's going to be tough on the family, but hey, praise the Lord, you know. You know, he's had six surgeries, and man, he's with the Lord, and reunion in heaven with mom and dad, and, you know, Larry's there, and, you know, he's naming the, all the folks that have gone before, and what a great, what a great reunion, you know, they're, they're experiencing. No more pain, no more operations. No more suffering. You know, if this hadn't happened, this last surgery, he would have been bedridden for a year. I'd hate to see him go through that, wouldn't you? Wow, to be with Jesus, wouldn't that be great? we got to pray, though, you know. And jury's going to miss him, the kids and everything. So we need to be in prayer. That's the difference between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and not. That's why Paul says we mourn and we weep. And we should with those that mourn and weep, as Jesus told us, but not as they weep. Because we have a hope. This was, the, this was the power. This is the mega powerful message <clears throat> that they were proclaiming. And I believe that if, if we will proclaim that message, share that message with others, we'll experience that same kind of power uh, in our lives. Uh, but uh, uh, these guys had mega power, but also mega grace. Same frame is used there when it says, and great grace, that's our same uh, word. Uh, grace was upon them the gifts and favor, favor of God that he pours out on the undeserving. Again, we say that we're saved by grace. We're saved because God gives us a new, a new life. And uh, it's, uh, it's not because of our goodness. It has nothing to do with morality. It has nothing to do with any of those things. It's simply we choose to receive God's favor. We choose to receive his grace, and we are completely undeserving. And I, I love the story of, uh, of Saul's grandson, uh, a young guy named Mephibosheth. And if you uh, don't know the story, uh, uh, Saul's uh, son Jonathan and David were, uh, were great friends and great, uh, great military leaders, national heroes uh, in Israel, uh, fought many battles together. And as, as a result of that, like, like a, lot of, a lot of guys, maybe some gals, <coughs> that are in the military, when they're going into combat sometimes, will actually say to uh, another close friend, <coughs> If anything happens to men, to me, take care of my family. And if anything happens to you, I'll take care of your family. And that's what David and Jonathan had pledged to one another very officially in a covenant form. And, of course, then you know that, that Jonathan is killed in battle there on Mount Gilboa. And, uh, and then when the, the news reaches David and there, there's, uh, you know, he's, he's crowned king and, and Judah later uh, conquers Jerusalem and then he takes over uh, the, uh, uh, the entire nation so he sends word out. He's looking, are there any descendants uh, of, of Saul that need to be taken care of? Are there any descendants 
of my friend uh, Jonathan. He's going to fulfill his obligation. Well, there was one. <coughs> uh, Jonathan had a son, Mephibosheth. But Mephibosheth, when he was a little guy, and this uh, word comes that Saul has died, and his father has died, his nurse babe, in running out to get him out of Jerusalem for fear of his death, because the normal process was when a new king took over, the first thing he did was then kill all the descendants of the previous king, so he never had to worry about one of them rising up in power and rebellion against him. It's what they did. This gal, assuming that this new king, whether, whether it would be David or someone else, would do the same, believed that she was helping uh, Mephibosheth, but she trips, she falls, the Bible says, <clears throat> and he is crippled as a result. David finds him, uh, brings him into his home, into his palace, tells him that, uh, you know, your father was my friend, uh, and we have a covenant relationship. I'll take care of you the rest of your life. I restore to you all the lands and everything that your grandfather owned, more than he could have ever dreamed. Here he was running away from this king, and this king actually was looking for him to show him grace, something that uh, he could have never uh, imagined. And then he says, and I want you to eat here at my table uh, every, every night with me. Uh, and if you at least uh, carry, at least visually, uh, the picture of this, uh, there's another kind of a cool part of it is that literally uh, as Mephibosheth would sit at that table every night and the King David would look upon him in kindness and, uh, and grace. He would never see his crippledness any longer. All of the mistakes of the past, all, all of the running and fear of this king that he was, he was doing would never be looked upon by that king again. Well, it's a great parallel. Because we have a, a king. Some of us were running from him for a very long time. Uh, and uh, we didn't know what to expect. We had no idea that the king, Jesus Christ, all he was trying to do was show us his love and his mercy and give us a place at the table. And he would remember our, our sins no more. But this is, this is Mephibosheth's uh, line that I love in 2 Samuel 9, 8. This is his response. Then he bows himself and says, What is your servant? that you should look upon such a dead dog as I. That's a very humbling uh, <laughs> line. Uh, in a way, he was. I mean, uh, in, a, in, a, in a secular sense, if David wasn't the spiritual man that he was, that's who he would have been, good as a dead dog. Uh, but uh, he was not responded to in, in that way. What he got was grace, mega grace. And, uh, and this early church recognized and realized it. We, we got the same. You know, we got the same grace that they've got. Uh, it hadn't changed any. Uh, our sin is the same as their sin, whatever it was. It's all covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. They've got a tremendous power in their lives because, uh, yeah, as Paul would say, they are not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for the salvation of anybody that would believe. Uh, and it wasn't a good environment that we're living in. It was a, it was a tough crowd that they're, that they're witnessing to, but power and grace was uh, upon their lives. And again... They lived, uh, again, not for a, a material world, uh, but for a spiritual world. And then their love was seen in a spiritual purpose there in verse 36 where it says, And Joseph, again, or Joseph, who was also named uh, Bar uh, Barnabas by the apostles, translated son of encouragement. Now, I'm interesting here for a couple of things. Uh, Luke introduces uh, Barnabas very early on for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, but in terms of who he is, uh, we see here that he's apparently a wealthy man. Uh, he is the brother of Mary, a wealthy woman who lived in Jerusalem. And when the disciples were in Jerusalem, they stayed at her house. She has a son named John Mark. John Mark, we get introduced to a little bit later. He will leave on the first missionary journey with Barnabas and with the Apostle Paul. So uh, John Mark, well, that's Uncle Barney to him uh, as, uh, as, they, as they head out. And, uh, and we'll learn more about uh, him as we go along. Uh, but uh, Luke wants us to see very early on. Uh, he's a man of tremendous generosity. He also wants us to understand that his generosity, and perhaps the admiration that he received, again, this is all done pretty, pretty publicly uh, there in terms of bringing this offering forward, uh, and the admiration he received uh, from it, from the people, may have been what sparked uh, Ananias and Sapphira to pretend to have sold him property and pretend to have uh, uh, given it all the way that Barnabas did here uh, on this occasion. You also have Barnabas rising to a place of prominence uh, within the early church. Uh, 
where they saw that coming and thought it might be a way for them to rise to prominence, that may also be part of the motivation uh, for the story we're going to read about next in terms of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, also, he looks, Luke introduces Barnabas early on because of his role in the ministry of the early church. He is mentioned 25 times in the book of Acts, five times in the epistles. He's one of the most important people in the New Testament. He's the guy that decides to travel up to Antioch, Antioch, Syria, uh, where there's a, a, a church that's growing. Uh, it's a cosmopolitan church. There's people from all over the world there. Uh, you name it, they got it. And uh, because it was on the Mediterranean, it was a major port, uh, and Barnabas uh, goes up there because, well, yeah, he's Jewish. He's even a Levite, but he, you know, but uh, he didn't grow up in Jerusalem. He didn't grow up uh, in Israel. He grew up uh, outside of Israel. He knows the Greek culture, Greek language, everything. He doesn't have a problem. So he goes up, and he's the encourager of this church that's up there. Then, then, when he recognized that nobody will reach out to this guy, for persecutor of the church, uh, Saul of Tarsus, uh, he will. So he goes down to see him, and you remember, he brings him back up to that church and says, man, you ought to be teaching the word up here, minister to these people. And then after a period of time, it's like, <clears throat> hey, we need to get the word out. You and I are going, you, you, you'll see it when we go out. When they first launch, it's Barnabas and, uh, and Paul or Saul. It's later that it becomes Paul and Barnabas. But Barnabas is the uh, instigator, uh, the encourager uh, in all of this. One thing would say that uh, uh, all of us, uh, or maybe none of us, can be a Peter or a Paul, but all of us can be a Barnabas. All of us can in, in, encourage others the way that he did. What a very cool thing that uh, they took his spiritual gift that became so prominent and actually named, named him and started calling him that uh, son of encouragement. Uh, secondly, besides being consistent in love, uh, there's a counterfeit generosity that brought fear to the early church, uh, as we mentioned with Ananias and Sapphira, verse 1 of chapter 5. But a certain man named Ananias with uh, Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the, of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now, it was about three hours later that his wife came in, having missed the text that her husband sent earlier. <laughs> not knowing what had happened I just, just a little insert and Peter answered tell me whether you sold the land for so much so she said yes for so much and Peter said to her how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord look the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last and the young men came in and found her dead carried her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. So <clears throat> fear comes, we say, uh, one of the reasons because of the deception. Now, just as an aside, her wife, her uh, Sapphira, her name in Aramaic means uh, beautiful. Uh, and the husband's name in uh, Hebrew uh, uh, means um, uh, God, is, uh, God is righteous. Uh, one writer said, Few people's lives have contradicted their names more dramatically because <laughs> they sure did not live up to it. Uh, again, they probably witnessed what happened with Barnabas uh, and thought to do the, the same thing. Uh, and uh, Peter is saying that uh, there is a lie that entered your heart that is directly from, uh, from Satan. And obviously they both uh, entered into this agreement. Uh, and this idea will sell the property. We're going to give a part of it there publicly right up front uh, in, the, in the church meeting and we're going to say uh, that we have, uh, we've given all of it uh, to, to the Lord. In verse 2 when it says and he kept, kept back part of the proceeds it can be uh, translated kept back in the word uh, we would be familiar with embezzled. Uh, in the Septuagint the Greek translation of the Old Testament the same word is used in Joshua 7.1 of a guy named Achan 
uh, who took the devoted things, things that were belonged to God, and he kept them, uh, and, um, and he, he, he died as well. That's why he's Aiken. I'm sorry, I just had to say that. <laughs> uh, Titus 2.10, uh, again, uh, it's used of a slave stealing from uh, his master. So it's the pious pretense uh, and so forth. Uh, it's spiritual deception. Uh, obviously, it's a serious issue uh, to God. <clears throat> Dr. Barnhouse... Uh, when he was still pastoring, uh, refused to allow his church, when they sang the hymn at Calvary, he always omitted the, the third stanza, which says, Now I have given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. And he said the reason that we omitted that verse, he says, because if God acted in the same way today that he did in the fifth chapter of Acts, You'd have to have a morgue in the basement of every church and a mortician on the pastoral staff. He says, the truth is, we wouldn't even have a pastoral staff uh, because uh, we can sing those hymns and say those things, you know, but we need to be careful. You know, the, the whole point here of their hypocrisy, and let's be clear what hypocrisy is, uh, because, uh, because we, we probably all get accused of being one from one, one time or another by our friends and family that love us so much. <laughs> because uh, uh, what, what it is, again, it comes to the Greek word hupokrite, uh, and it means to speak through a false face. It comes from the Greek uh, theater, uh, because to them, when they would enter, enter the stage, they would have a box with them with a series of masks. And so if, if that particular scene required them to be happy, they would take the mask out, and it would have a smile on it, and they would speak through it. Uh, and then if they later were sad, they would switch masks, put that mask, and they would speak through it. They're speaking through a false face. Uh, so they were hypocritical. Uh, they were pretending to be something that they weren't. Uh, that's not the same uh, as a Christian who's struggling with some aspect of, of sin in their life. That's not the same uh, uh, as, uh, as believers uh, who, uh, who are still trying to crucify the old man dead, our old nature and so forth, and really live a life according to the Spirit. Uh, and of course, there's only a few Christians that don't have that struggle, and we have a name for them. They're called liars. <laughs> because we're all struggling, you know, with, uh, with uh, uh, one thing or, or, or another. Uh, it becomes hypocritical when we pretend we're not, when we're saying we're more uh, than we're, we're not. And that's what was going on here. As he says in verse 4, you've lied not to men, uh, but to God. Here a direct reference to the deity of the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, you've lied to God. Uh, and again, he tries to explain to him, uh, you, you, don't, you didn't have to say you gave everything. You simply could have said, uh, well, we sold the property, we got this much money. We just don't feel light or feel comfortable at this point in time uh, giving everything. We're just going to give this, this portion right here. Hey, praise the Lord. You know, thank you for your generosity. That's, uh, that would have been fine. Uh, but uh, that's not what happens uh, here. Uh, whether it was a craving for recognition, leadership, uh, adoration, uh, we don't know. But uh, again, uh, they, uh, they suffer divine, uh, divine judgment. And again, uh, to make it clear, this is not casual deception. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something much uh, deeper uh, than that. And, uh, uh, you know, it's better just to be honest with God, just to be open with God, because he knows our hearts anyway. Um, you know, we have the kind of the classic, uh, you know, story of Mary and Martha. Uh, their brother Lazarus is sick unto death. They turn word to Jesus, uh, you know, can you get here? Uh, and obviously, uh, Jesus stayed in their home many times, knew them well. They opened their hearts as well as their home to the Lord. Uh, she's uh, fully expecting him uh, to show up and heal their brother. She'd seen him do it many times. Of course, Jesus delayed his coming. He allows Lazarus to die. And, uh, and then when he finally comes, uh, Martha's ticked. And she uh, marches out down the road, meets Jesus halfway there. And she pretty much gives him a piece of her mind and, uh, and, and everything. What, and what was Jesus' response to that? Do you believe in the resurrection? Why? <laughs> And he just ministers to her. Uh, it's okay. Uh, uh, God would rather have us be honest, even if we're angry with him, because he knows it anyway. Uh, and if we'll come to him, even in that state, he'll still, he'll still listen to us. He'll still uh, minister to us. Uh, but uh, we don't want to become uh, the Ananias uh, that many people today have become. Uh, some of the ways we can do that, of course, are by creating the impression that we're people of prayer when we're really not. 
uh, making it look like we've got it all together when we, when we don't. Promoting the idea that we're very generous. When we're so tight, we squeak when we smile. I'm sorry, I just, <laughs> I love little figures of speech. Thought that was a good one. Uh, we, we misrepresent our spiritual effectiveness. Yes, when Billy Graham came to New York, I was in charge of all of the follow-up counselors there. Really? No, I think you substituted as one of the guys on the ground there. Yeah, you helped out. You're, you know, we, we, we are given to uh, uh, exaggeration. When a, when a preacher or, or, uh, urges people to a, a deeper devotion to God and he doesn't even have one himself, and, and we could go on and on. Th this is the sin of Ananias, and, uh, and we probably can all be thankful the fact that, uh, that, that God doesn't still uh, do these kinds of things uh, on, a regular, on a regular basis. Secondly, we say this fear came, again, as a judgment. It definitely was a judgment. Uh, did God really kill two people because they lied about a business transaction? Yes, that's exactly what uh, we have happened here. Has he ever done that before? Yes, he has. And it seems to be at, uh, uh, at turning points in, uh, uh, in terms of uh, God and his people uh, and his working in and through their lives. Moses delivers the children of Israel out of Egypt. As you recall, uh, he goes up on Mount Sinai to receive the law. And very shortly after that, we've got two characters, Nab <laughs> Nadab and Abihu, who are our priests. Uh, and they basically are, are going in without a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, description of that to burn strange fire before the Lord. They were breaking the law and do, doing some real stupid stuff. And God killed them both uh, right there because this is the beginning. Children of Israel were taking them to the promised land. It was a huge time in, in the life of God's people. And God dealt very uh, severely. We've mentioned Achan already. Joshua takes the rain. They're actually across the Jordan. They're going in. The first battle. They're in Jericho. The wall's falling down. Hey, this is all dedicated to God. Don't touch anything. And, of course, uh, we know that he did. Uh, and he died, along with his whole family and so forth, were judged. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a turning point in uh, what God was doing with, uh, with his people. Uh, and also say this is a judgment of God and not of Peter. I think Peter was as shocked as anybody else. Uh, I, I think, you know, I don't think he's going, watch this. You know, I, I think he, he's probably like, you know, uh, you know, just kind of shocked at the, uh, at the whole thing. I, um, I was, uh, yeah, when I went to Chip Sandy, I was praying for this, uh, uh, <coughs> for this gal. We, you know, they always line up for prayer afterwards because there's no doctor, there's no nothing, there's no Kaiser, there's no Tylenol, there's just nothing. Either, you know, if you got something wrong, you ask Jesus to heal you, and if he doesn't, you, you, that's it. You know, that was, so they, they line up, and we'll, you know, pray for an hour or longer sometimes. <clears throat> and, uh, and as uh, I was with Mike and, um, and everything, and uh, the, uh, anyway, the, the gals or whatever they're turning, they, they kneel in front of you, you lay hands on them, and pray for them. And I started to pray for this one gal. I just started to pray for her in Jesus' name or whatever, whatever I thought was wrong with her. And uh, I've got a translator, of course. And, man, she just drops over. She just went out. I'm like, medic, you know, woman down here. You know, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not like, wow, look what I, you know, I'm just like, I'm just shocked as anybody else. I'm like, uh, uh, check, should we be checking for a pulse or something, you know? I mean, she was completely unconscious, and, uh, uh, and I'm talking to the uh, translator, like, uh, shouldn't uh, we, should we be doing something here, you know? And uh, a couple of the gals grab her and just, like, drag her. This is a dirt floor church, by the way. And we're out in the country. Drag, drag her off to the side. Oh, brother, she, she will be fine later. You know, these women, they come in, and the men, and they've been worshiping the idols, you know, in the morning. And the demons are there. You worship the demons. The demons can take control of you. You say the name of Jesus, the demons will flee. That's all that's happened, brother. Pray for that person. <laughs> Get in. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> I, I think Peter is as shocked as anybody else. This, this is a, a, a judgment of God that's, uh, that's here. Uh, the fear came as a result of a, a judgment. In terms of the sin itself, uh, again, verse 3, is energized by Satan. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Satan knows that if he can get to the heart and the mind, uh, he can affect uh, uh, every aspect of us. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, basically... Uh, 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 has a, a great piece on the fact that uh, at the root of every sin really is pride, and I think we can see that with uh, this pretense of a gift here. Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, sin has many tools, uh, but a lie is the handle which fits them all. And certainly, Proverbs 8.13, 
fits here where it says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate, uh, says God. So uh, Barnabas gives a, a tremendous uh, generous offering, maybe receives some, uh, some kudos from that. Uh, they come in behind thinking that, um, hey, we can get some glory for this. God deals very harshly with them. Uh, and we would say, thirdly, the fear came because of the sin was directed against God. God loves his church. Uh, and he wasn't going to allow at this juncture uh, of the church, obviously very critical uh, in its birth here, uh, to be destroyed uh, by corrupting, uh, allowing corrupt corruption and hypocrisy, uh, corruption and what potentially could have been the leadership uh, to materialize. Uh, and then we have uh, the fear came to a group of people now called the church. And I mentioned that because in verse 11, we have the first mention of that particular word. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Uh, the Greek word is uh, uh, ekklesia. Uh, and of course, we kind of can just say that into English and, uh, and get a term for at least the, the liturgical church that uh, is around today. Uh, but it's the first mention. Uh, it's a Greek term that means the called out one. So when a, uh, uh, in, in the Greek language, when someone entered a village with an announcement, an important announcement on behalf of the king, uh, he would call everyone to come out of your homes, to come out to, so that you can hear this announcement. So to come out from where you were before. So people that are part of the, the church are people that have come out of a life that they were in before and into a new life uh, through the grace of God. Uh, again, uh, we would say pretty severe, uh, but um, I think uh, truth matters to God. It's just, it's just a wonder uh, these, maybe these things don't happen a little more often, but uh, uh, it's important for us to recognize that uh, uh, we need to be careful uh, because uh, uh, Satan, is, Satan is a liar from the beginning. Uh, he convinced with a lie, uh, Eve and, uh, and Adam, uh, to believe a lie against the character of God and bring uh, sin into this world. Uh, and our culture is riddled with it, uh, uh, with, uh, you know, through uh, the media and all kinds of hype and, uh, and so forth. Uh, it's, it's amazing. If you just watch, uh, you'll be watching all those Super Bowl commercials today. You might take a note of, is that really true? You know, was there really an unbiased sampling? And everyone preferred Coca-Cola the most because it's the real thing. <laughs> but then there was that other unbiased sampling, and everyone found Pepsi to be the real thing. See, you know, I, 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 where are these surveys coming from? I don't understand. Uh, can, can a toilet paper really be soft as a cloud? Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know how the guy came up with that comparison. But, uh, there's just outrageous claims. You know, they're absolutely not true. And we're bombarded with them all the time. Uh, and we can actually uh, start to think that it's okay. That it's okay to, to uh, ex exaggerate uh, things a little bit. Be, uh, to make ourselves seem a little, a little bit better than, uh, than, we, than we really are and so forth. Because it's done all the time in a secular environment. People are always getting in trouble these days with uh, lying about their resumes and so forth because uh, a lot of them don't get caught. <clears throat> the, uh, 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 people that teach at universities now have to have programs so they can scan uh, the term papers they take in to see if they're plagiarized or not, see if they've come off at another website. Uh, it's, just, it's just become very, very commonplace, uh, unfortunately. And uh, uh, just to encourage parents that... Uh, it's a big issue with your kids. Dr. Samuel Johnson once wrote, accustom your children constantly to this, <clears throat> the telling the truth. If a thing happened at one window and they, uh, when related, they said it happened at another, don't let it pass. Instantly check them. You do not know where deviation from truth will end. It is more from carelessness about truth than from intentional lying that there is so much falsehood in the world. So I... You know, there's certain things that you got to come down on heavy with your kids, you know, if they're doing something to hurt themselves, if they're doing something to hurt them, uh, someone else, and if they're lying. If you can teach your kids it's never acceptable, they always have to uh, tell the truth. Uh, it'll, it'll change your relationship with them and, uh, and certainly uh, make them better men and women in the future. Uh, they were consistent in their love. A counterfeit generosity brought fear, uh, but they continued in power. Verse 12 to 16. Uh, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch there on the Temple Mount. <coughs> you know, the rest there joined them. 
but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. There's a first reference to uh, the gals now hearing the gospel, coming to faith. Uh, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So the outcome of uh, the love and the unit that they have, because they're growing it really in love with the Lord, uh, of healthy fear of the Lord comes uh, upon them, a tremendous power is, uh, is demonstrated here. And we certainly note that uh, uh, there is tremendous power uh, to heal and so forth in, in the apostles themselves, uh, in uh, the reference here to, uh, to Peter. Uh, we'd also note that as we continue through the, the book of Acts, some of the regular folks uh, have, the, have the abilities to pray and see uh, God move miraculously uh, as well. And, uh, and we don't believe that these things ended somehow at the time of the apostles uh, we believe that God continues to do the miraculous and continues to, uh, to heal today. And, uh, and so, you know, we never know what God's will is, uh, but uh, we know that he is the great physician. You know, if you, if you got the first uh, verse of the Bible down, in the beginning God created. That's everything out of nothing. You know, then to pray for somebody to be healed of cancer or headache or whatever else, it's not like the Olympic. Olympics. It's not degree of difficulty. It's just whether God's, God speaks it or not uh, for that person to be raised up. So we want to pray. We want to pray uh, in, in faith. We thank God for all of the uh, he's uh, made available to us here in the West in terms of uh, uh, great medical care and so forth. Uh, but God continues to do powerful things uh, in among us and in the, uh, the church here. And, uh, and certainly we Praise him and thank him for it. But here's an early church. We're learning for them how to pray. Uh, we're learning that we can have a tremendous fellowship and unity among each other as long as we're all still growing uh, in our love for Jesus Christ. That's, uh, that's, that's the key. Uh, that it's a good thing to have a healthy fear of the Lord. Again, Solomon says uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. And literally it means of, it's the beginning of everything. Uh, we won't really be able to figure up from down, left, from right, uh, uh, spiritually uh, and really rationally uh, if we don't have a healthy fear of God, a reverence uh, for, for God. Uh, and it's a little difficult sometimes because we've come to know God through Jesus Christ, the suffering servant that came to die for our sins. That guy looked like a hippie wearing, uh, wearing sandals and beard and all that stuff. I was like, yeah, that, that guy's kind of cool. I think I'm okay with God. Uh, and that's good. Uh, Jesus did everything he could so he would not be intimidating to us, but so that he would be ex accessible to everyone. How so? Being born in a cave. Let's, let's just start right there. Being laid in a manger. Everything was about him. But we also need to, now, now that we know him, go read the end of the book, the book of Revelation, at least the opening chapters to go, Oh, wow, this is a, a different Jesus here in heaven. He's the conquering king. He's coming soon. And, man, the description of his, man, his eyes even look like you. And, wow, you know, uh, that's, that's Jesus that's, that's coming. Uh, we need to have a healthy reverence uh, in a fear for God. Uh, and be careful that uh, these little areas of hypocrisy uh, don't end our life. Uh, and if we need to come before the Lord, come before the Lord. Uh, you know, better to judge yourself than to be judged by God. And uh, because he does want to move uh, powerfully uh, in and through our lives.
Thank you. 